Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon to everybody and a very warm welcome to this afternoon's session. Thank you for actually taking the time to join us today. And good evening from some people as well. Okay, so how to find calm during stressful times. Now I'm sure that's uh, many of us in today's session. We're here today and we're looking for answers to this very pertinent question. And especially during stressful exam time. So I'm just going to quickly stop my screen share. Okay, great. Um, so our esteemed uh, presenters today are going to be discussing with you strategies to help you find calm. Uh, so thank you again for joining us in today's wellness session that's designed to help you find your calm and to prepare for exams in the best way possible. My name is Mariam Jassad and I'm a psychologist at Student Support Services in the College of Humanities. And I'm pleased that so many of you could join us today and be part of today's webinar. As a reminder, the outline of today's session, um, we're going to be looking at the following areas. We're going to be looking at meditation, its benefits in calming your mind, improving your focus, and reducing anxiety, which is what we all need in those anxious times. We're going to be looking at some breath work, work techniques to help you manage stress and maintain calm during exams. We're going to be looking at the connection between exercise and cognitive performance and how to incorporate physical activity into your daily routine to enhance your energy, productivity, and overall well-being. And these topics are going to be addressed by our keynote speak, uh, speaker, Professor Pillay. Um, and then our psychologists um, and student development practitioners from the different colleges will be sharing some advices on how to prepare for your exams, looking at a positive mindset, self-care, time management, active learning, and exam taking. So as I mentioned, our keynote speaker for this afternoon is Professor Surrender Pillay. Prof. Pillay is a professor of taxation and the head of department of accounting at UKZN. He's an expert in the field of taxation, having worked at SARS for many years and is a consultant to many multinational companies. Prof. Pillay is an alumni of our university, having completed his e-com um, and his honours degree at the University of Natal. He then read for his master's and PhD at the Northwest University. Now you're probably thinking, uh, expert in taxation, professor uh, in the School of Accounting, uh, and what's the link between stress and exam? Properly has a great understanding on the subject and a great appreciation for what it takes to be truly successful. He's actually completed his master's exam with distinction and completed his PhD with no examiner correction. And that is an amazing achievement. In addition, Prof. Pillay is the author of a book titled Passing Exams Easily, which is a guide to student success. And the book explores aspects of student success from um, exam techniques, to looking at improving memory, IQ, uh, which is emotional intelligence, as well as um, exam stress. In addition, Prof. Pillay is the chair of the Yoga Institute, um, and I believe he hosts yoga classes on the West Coast campus. So please join me in welcoming Prof. Pillay to today's session. And from that brief uh, resume, you. Uh, you may you could have figured that he's actually well placed to be sharing um, these advices with us. So, Prof. Pele, I hand over to you. I'm going to stop sharing. So much, uh, Madam. Really appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everybody, and I hope the session today is going to be quite enlightening and enlightening to everybody. 
I'm just going to try and share screen on my side uh, for the presentation itself. Okay, so once again, thank you to the college for allowing me to actually present today. Um, today, I will present on the areas that uh, Madam has just spoken about. Um, I've also included nutrition for mine. Uh, I've, I'll include exercise briefly in my talks when I do talk about breath work, etc. Um, so these are the areas that roughly I'm going to cover today: your nutrition, uh, breath work, and meditation, as well as some practical techniques uh, for everybody to practice on breath work and meditation. So I advise a lot of my students. I do see a lot of students. Uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate um, in our school. And of course, every, all the students have the same problem uh, with stress management and, and in terms of the content that they have to, to cover. So the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is your nutrition level. And I always talk to my students about this because I was lectured on this by a great professor in, in Cape Town, University of Cape Town, who was actually um, a food fundi. Um, and he also was also quite interested in, in food and how it affects the mind. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much of time on this, but I think it's, it's, it has value. Uh, to a student. Uh, I've always advised my students to look at the most best foods that will make you more smarter and allow your memory to, to improve also. Uh, the first thing is sort of almost basic, but I'd avoid alcohol, drugs, and weed. Um, I would think that those are the things that you really don't, don't want to be doing. Um, the weed, some people think it's actually good for you, but it's actually not that good for you because um, there's a, an ingredient called THC in it, uh, which actually um, allows you to become intoxicated. So I would avoid uh, that. Sugar is is something that makes you stupid. Uh, and why I say that is because um, sugar, when it does metabolize into your body, it does absorb a lot of vitamin B vitamins. So B1, vitamin B2, B3, B6, B12, all of those B vitamins, which are essential for what they call cognitive functioning, understanding and memory, um, actually dissipate and get dissolved in the process. Uh, caffeine um, also gives people a lot of energy and, and people do feel hyped up with it. Uh, the problem with caffeine is that uh, it's effect on adrenaline um, makes it volatile. So the adrenaline spikes that you feel in your body um, and in your mind when you do have caffeine uh, allows you to, to have these spurts of energy and then a very, very um, big low, I could call it, a drop in energy. So what are the things that we should be going for? Uh, choline, which is a very, very powerful um, ingredient that is found um, in, in nature. You can actually eat a lot of uh, foods that have choline in it. And those are typically your nuts and seeds, berries, uh, fish, uh, greens, and avocados. Um, something called alpha GPC, which is available on um, in your pharmacies, phospholipid serine. All of these things do improve uh, memory and IQ. Nuts and seeds, very, very important. Um, I, have, I have nuts and seeds every day. I have berries every day uh, because these things have been found to be effective uh, in terms of cognitive functioning um, and actually uh, improving your memory. Uh, fatty fish, high in omega-3, very, very good, uh, good brain food. Uh, leafy green vegetables. Um, I know not many people uh, enjoy vegetables these days because they're all more taken away by the meat diet, but greens are also important. Avocados are excellent. And the other thing that we, we can also look at is um, foods that lower your stress level. And this is something that I was actually interested in because I wanted to advise my students and tell my students about what foods can actually lower their stress levels because they're so stressed. Uh, and there's two that came to mind. One was blueberries. Uh, which are very, very good. So if you have a chance to buy blueberries, please buy that for your own stress levels. Um, the other one is ashwagandha, which is a herb. Um, and you can get that in a tablet form as well. Those contain ingredients called or, or molecules known as adaptogens. And those adaptogens have been found to lower cortisol levels, which are associated with high stress. So if you have a uh, amount of berries and ashwagandha, usually your stress levels do, do lower. And this is without meditation or without any breathing technique. Uh, just eating the stuff will actually lower your stress level. Um, also, pumpkin seeds also a little bit effective in lowering blood pressure. So these type of uh, foods, we need to be aware of them because if you want to perform at your best level, you need to be putting into your body uh, the stuff that's really good for you. Uh, you want to avoid uh, the stuff that actually impairs your performance in terms of um, memory and cognitive ability and intelligence. Only a stupid person would want to make themselves more stupid. So basically what we're trying to say here is that this will actually improve your, your IQ and memory capacity. And having that improvement will allow you to actually uh, produce better results. So today, the focus is more uh, on breath work and meditation. I'll, I'll throw in a little bit of exercise and its value in it. But what is actual breath work? And breath work it basically refers to a variety of different exercises with a conscious control of your breathing. Right? So, And these breathing patterns are there uh, unconsciously most of the time. 
because we don't aware of our breathing. But as soon as we become aware of our breathing, we have ability or we have the ability to, uh, to now change our breathing pattern. And changing your breathing pattern will allow you to improve your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And I've been doing breathing exercises for a very, very long time, over 20 years, two decades. And I found that in that process of, of practicing these breathing techniques, my focus is much more better. Um, in the original form, the breathing techniques were practiced for long, um, a long time ago. Uh, you'll find that uh, a technique known as pranayama, which is a scientific art of mastering your breath, that, that forms from that form part of yoga. This pranayama was there over 5,000 years ago and was done originally for meditative purposes only. But now breathing has a much wider context. Uh, deep breathing and, and breath work um, has been shown in study after study to lower your stress levels. Um, so the, there's three of them that we're going to discuss today. The first one is deep breathing. And this often, this involves very, very slow inhalations and slow exhalations and, and expansion of the abdomen during the inhalation, contraction during the exhalation. We'll do one technique like this uh, in the session today. Uh, the other one is called diaphragmatic breathing. This is also an expansion of your entire diaphragm as inhalation goes in. And of course, allows for bigger, better oxygen exchange in your lungs when this happens. And then a contraction of diaphragm uh, when you do exhale. I'll also discuss uh, some pranayama techniques, pranayama, where we look at alternative nostril breathing and another technique known as Kapalabhati pranayama. So these techniques have been found to be very, very effective uh, in lowering blood pressure, improving concentration, etc. Uh, in, in medical journals as well. So there is a medical journal supporting this, this type of uh, breathing techniques for our daily um, practice. And people must be also wondering, I mean, what is, uh, what is meditation? Um, so meditation is a practice that involves training the mind to induce um, a state of consciousness that, it, that promotes mental well-being. So you're basically a much more calm person um, in those circumstances. And we know how we all get so emotional during uh, different periods in our life and different times during the day. Uh, but meditation allows you just to be a bit more centered, a bit more still in those moments and just be a bit more level-headed. Um, and I think that makes a big difference because in our daily lives, whether you're a student or whether you're, you're working in the corporate world, um, you're going to get situations which are going to flutter you or going to make you, uh, you know, um, emotionally more charged. And meditation is that center that allows you to be a bit more calm, a bit more, a bit more objective, uh, and make the right decisions at the right point in time. Also to say the right thing at the right time. Because remember, our words have such powerful effects on each other. And sometimes just a, a moment, um, a small moment uh, where you lose your, your emotional calmness can affect another person quite badly if you say the wrong thing. So it's very, very important to have that meditation calmness uh, inside you so you're able to actually express the right thing at the right time also. So what are the aspects of meditation that are, that are really working today? Uh, mindfulness meditation, this is a process where we focus on the present moment um, and we just pay attention to our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations and the environment around us. And hopefully, if I have time today, I'll, I'll go through a guided mindfulness meditation session with you. I'm definitely going to do a mantra-based meditation or transcendental meditation with you, which is basically using certain word syllables uh, to slow down your heart rate and your breathing rate uh, so that you can focus better. And there's also concentration meditation, which is a bit hard, uh, the way you take a specific object and focus on that. Um, and this was done by uh, yoga masters uh, for hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands of years. Um, it is a very, very demanding technique to do concentration meditation. Um, the easier one to do is the sound meditation, uh, which now everybody, I mean, even my own students, my postgraduate students in accounting come to me and, and tell me, you know what, I'm using this, this uh, app, Headspace. It's working quite well. I'm doing it every day. So I've got students to, to actually meditate on Headspace or Calm or, or Budify because these apps are right there for everybody to use uh, just to calm their mind down. So and music is such an easy way to, to get more calm uh, and more focused. So I would advise you to, to try sound meditation. Definitely try um, the word-based or mantra-based meditation. Uh, those two work. And mindfulness also can be used as well. There's also guided, guided mindfulness meditation techniques on YouTube uh, that you can go through and look at. Um, so those are some of the prominent meditation techniques that are out there at the moment, um, if you're interested in that. Um, the benefits are just amazing. And, I'm, and I only put it here because I just wanted you to, to see what this does. Uh, the studies on, on mindfulness, just on, my, on, on mindfulness alone, are strong. You know, um, if you look at memory enhancement, there's studies being done showing that mindfulness meditation will increase your memory and improve your flexibility. There's improved cognitive function. That means your response time, your understanding uh, of something, of subject matter, 
is improved with when you do meditation practices. Um, IQ, this is something we all want to improve, right? Um, IQ can also um, be affected by mindfulness meditation. It improves that. Um, we saw significant increases um, in IQ scores in certain studies done in 2011 by GSA. Uh, neurophysiological changes, breathwork and meditation have been associated with brain structure. Now, what we mean by neurophysiological changes, something called neuroplasticity, which means the basic ability of the brain to rewire itself. Uh, so if you learn a new skill, for example, playing a violin or playing a piano, uh, your brain will actually start to adapt itself and start to develop new neurons and new neural pathways to learn to play that instrument. Uh, what we found is that people who meditate more have faster um, neuroplasticity. Uh, that means better neuro neuroplasticity in, in the sense that they actually develop the learning faster. They're able to learn new skills uh, quicker because the brain is more flexible. Um, so these type of things are all enhanced by uh, breath work and meditation because breath work also reduces your stress level. Now, besides this, this breath work and meditation, ex I also want to bring in exercise here as well. Uh, there's a very, very good interview uh, by Andrew Huberman, who I follow as a neuroscientist at Stanford. And he talks a lot about uh, the neuroscience of memory, IQ success, and overall well-being. And one of the, the interviews, he did um, interview a professor from New York University, um, and she's a professor of neuroscience. One of the things was exercise that came up um, in that interview. And for exercise, if you even do 10 minutes of exercise, there's enough evidence to show there's a mood change uh, in your mind. And so if you want to change your mood, you're depressed, uh, you're sad, you're anxious, you're nervous, just doing 10 minutes of exercise, whether it be cardiovascular exercise, walking out, uh, walking, running, jogging, uh, whatever it is, even uh, the slowest of walks, just some type of movement, uh, whether it's cycling, anything to get you moving, um, there is a change in mood uh, in terms of the hormones that are released by your brain. The other thing to be aware of is that if you do more than 10 minutes, say you do 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and you start to get your heart rate moving up higher, then something happens in your brain, you know, in an area called known as the hippocampus. And that area is associated with memory. And people who have been exercising for 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day, um, more or less on a regular schedule, show that the hippocampus actually grows. That means the memory ability is now enhanced uh, as a result of it. So 10 minutes just basically for, for mood change and minimal changes, but 20, 30 minutes with heart rate movement, you'll actually find you be, yourself becoming sharper uh, intellectually and your memory improving. So that's why both... Uh, exercise and meditation for me are extremely important. I do both every day uh, because I know the effects that it has on your mind. And the, the more sedentary you are, the more um, sort of, um, I wouldn't say lazy, but less likely to move. And you, you know, we, sit, we all sit at our discs uh, for such a long period of time. The more um, likely we are to get these diseases that impair our cognitive function like Alzheimer's and dementia, etc. So that's just a quick uh, word on exercise, etc. Yeah. So now what we're going to do now is move into I'm just going to stop the presentation here for a little bit um, because it's, I think people need to see me when I'm doing this. So we're now going to move into a phase where we do going to do actual breathing techniques uh, with you. So the first one is a deep counting, um, deep count four technique. Uh, this technique is basically to, to slow your, your heart rate down and slow your overall breathing down. It's a prelude to meditation. And you, should, you can practice this anywhere. Normally, you practice this for one to two minutes. Um, as one technique. I'm going to do three techniques with you today. This is the first one, deep breathing. So if you're with me right now, you can join me in this uh, deep breathing uh, technique. Um, I want you to close your eyes if you're there um, and slowly breathe into your nose. We're going to count to four. One, two, three. And now exhale to your nose. One, two, three, four. All right, let's do it again. Slowly breathe in, we count to four. One, two, three, four. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Now, why do we close our eyes in this? It's our eyes normally distract us away from attention within ourselves. So a very, very good thing to do to where you're meditating or doing breath work is to just close your eyes and get to your center again. And when you do it, you find that yourself being more calm, more focused, and getting better results in terms of trying to lower your, your heart rate and your breathing. So let's try do it one, one more time. We're going to slowly breathe in. One, two, three, four. And exhale. One, two, three, four. So that's deep breathing. 
as I said before, one to two minutes should be enough to practice this technique uh, before you do your meditation. You can practice it twice a day, uh, both morning and afternoon. And you can even practice it at lunchtime if you want to. So it's quite an easy technique to do. Uh, the main thing is to keep your count right um, as from one to four. And once you get that, you'll find, once you do this one minute, you find yourself already a bit more calmer, right? But that's not enough uh, to get you to a state uh, of calmness for meditation, right? So the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna share screen again with you just to show you the overall technique of the next one, which is a bit more, uh, slightly more complicated, is known as Kabale Bhattapranayam. So this technique, and don't worry about the spelling and how to pronounce it, it is quite long, uh, but sit comfortably um, in a nice posture. But the main thing here is that with these techniques is that your back, neck, and head must be straight uh, when you're doing these techniques, right? So you can't be sitting crouched um, down or your, your back bent. You have to keep your back, neck, and head straight in these postures when you are doing them. So when you actually sit cross-legged or you can sit on a chair doing this um, or, you can, or you can sit um, on, a, on a mattress, uh, on a cushion, uh, whatever is comfortable for you, try and try and sit in that. Sit comfortably in that. And once you, you sit comfortably with your back, neck, and head straight, you can do some deep inhalations and exhalations, which is what we thought of, what we talked about now, uh, four count breathing. And thereafter, uh, the technique actually starts. Now, the technique to Kabbalah Bhatti is that when you exhale, you got a force exhale. That means basically your stomach goes in and it's a very rapid push of your stomach, your navel towards your spine as you exhale. So when you actually look at Kabbalah Bhatti, uh, people are doing it, it's going to be, right? So if you didn't see that again, I'm going to exhale very, very fast. Inhale, normal. Exhale fast. Inhale, normal. While you're exhaling, your stomach must be pushed in um, towards your navel, towards your spine, as much as you can. So it's a forced exhalation with your stomach being pushed in. Inhale. Force exhale. Inhale. When you're relaxing and you're inhaling again, your stomach just naturally comes back to its normal position in Kabbalah Bhatti Pranayam. Uh, it's a very, very, very good technique. It has multiple benefits. Um, for health and physiology, it's known to actually lower stress levels a lot. So we're going to try and do this Kabbalah Bhatti Pranayam technique together uh, for one minute at least. So let's, let's do it slow inhalation first. Force exhalation. Inhale slow. Exhale fast. Hard and fast. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. The inhalation is not fast. Inhalation is relaxed. Okay. Force exhale. Inhale, exhale. Now, what I'm going to do for you now is a quick demonstration of Kabbalah Bhatti with the rapid breathing. So what I did there was very, very slow. So if you want to do it a bit more quicker, you're going to do it, it's going to come out something like this. You can try with me together if you want to, wherever you are. Let's do a deep inhalation. Now let's start, start force exhaling. As you exhale, your stomach is pumping in. Your nose should be making that sound of forced exhalation coming out through your nostril when you're doing it. It's hard, it's pumped, it's exhaled, and that uh, causes a, a change in the metabolism in your body. Let's do it for 30 seconds more. Once you finish Kabbalah Bhati, take a deep inhalation, then exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, and exhale. So in my yoga, yoga classes that I do in, in Westford, we do this technique after we do our yoga asana or positions, and there after this we do meditation. So it's a very, very good te technique to get you ready for meditation. I'm going to do one last breathing technique with you, which is called alternative nostril breathing or analoma viloma pranayama. It's going to go to slide eight for that. All right, so this is basically an overview of the this breathing technique. You got to sit comfortably once again, and we don't mind you sitting in a chair if you want to sit in a chair. Um, and this operates through your nostrils. So you're going to use um, your right hand to block and release nostrils specifically. And as you block one nostril, you're going to breathe into the other. And once you breathe into one nostril, you breathe out to the other nostril. All right? Um, the the technique is that you'll use your right hand with your thumb and your ring finger to block and release nostrils, and you'll inhale through one and out through the other. Now you can do this uh, up to five minutes at, at a beginner level, 
and gradually increase it. Some of the studies on this has been quite amazing with the anonoma biloma pranayama. Uh, what's happened with it is that it's shown to reduce blood pressure within four weeks. 30% of your BP is reduced by this technique. If you do it five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the evening with no controls. So basically, if you do this without any changes in your diet, without changes, any changes in your exercise, you can actually reduce your blood pressure naturally using doing this technique. Right. So if you know anybody with high blood pressure, they'll also get benefit from this technique. So I'm going to show you how to do it. You can practice with me together if you want to. You can take your right hand and your three fingers of your right hand. Now, I, they do say use your ring finger. I'm more comfortable with my pinky finger. But if you want to use your ring finger, that's also fine to, to block and release nostril, right? So basically, your right hand, your left hand is down. Your right hand is there. Your back neck and head must be straight, uh, sitting on your chair or in a lotus posture or on the ground on a cushion. And you're going to use, place your three fingers at the center before. And this is quite easy to do. You know, use firstly take your your right thumb to block your right nostril. Slowly breathe into your left nostril. Then use your pinky to block your left nostril and breathe out your right. Then repeat again. Right nostril in. Use the thumb to block your right nostril. Now breathe out to your left nostril. Breathe into the same left nostril. Use your pinky to block your left. Now breathe out your right nostril. Let's try and do it together, right? So we're trying to make it as interactive as possible. So you can try and practice this with me. We're going to do it together for at least two minutes, right? So let's get our three fingers um, together, place them in the center before it. Use the right thumb slowly to block your right nostril. Slowly breathe into your left nostril. Now block your left with your pinky, breathe out your right nostril. Once again, breathe into your right nostril. Now use your thumb to block your right, breathe out your left nostril. Breathe into the same left nostril. Block your left nostril, breathe out your right. Breathe into your right nostril again. Block your right with your thumb, breathe out to your left. Breathe into your left. Block your left with your pinky, breathe out to your right. Into your right nostril again. Use the thumb to block your right nostril, breathe out to your left nostril. Into your left nostril again. Now block your left nostril, breathe out to your right nostril. Into your right nostril. Block your right nostril, breathe out your left nostril. We're going to do it three more times. I want you to close your eyes doing this and, and deep breathing. Slowly breathe into your left nostril. Block your left, breathe out your right. Into your right nostril again. Block your right nostril, breathe out your left. Once again, slowly breathe into your left nostril. Now block your left nostril and breathe out your right nostril. And relax. So that's basically Kabbalah, but uh, Anuloma Viloma Pranayama, alternative nostril breathing. So how do you go about doing it? The first thing you do is deep breathing, the four count. Breathe in one, two, three, four, inhalation. Exhale, one, two, three, four. And you do that for one minute. Once you've done that, you go into Kabbalah, but Pranayama, where you exhale as a forced exhalation. Inhale, relax. You can do that for one to two minutes. And once you've done, once you finish that, you can do the final pranayama, which is anuloma viloma pranayama, where you block and release nostrils for one to two minutes, and that will give you about five minutes of uh, breathing techniques that you can practice. Remember, uh, if you like alternative nostril breathing, you can go as long as five minutes. So your breath work can actually even go for ten minutes uh, if you want to. Uh, but that's pretty much the breathing uh, summary that I wanted to give you in this session. I'm going to go to meditation now. And just look at what are the meditation techniques that we can do as well. As we said before, there's the Hong So technique, which is a um, sound technique, mantra-based technique. There's also mindfulness meditation, I would, uh, where you do a guided meditation. Um, and I'm not, not sure if we're going to have time to, to do that one right now. Uh, and there's also sound meditation called Yoga Nidra. Right? But what I do want to do with you right now is do the, firstly the, the mantra-based meditation or the word syllable-based meditation where we use a word syllable to slow our heart rate and breathing down. So this is after you've done your breathing techniques. You can do this technique. So the meditation, remember, it's about calming your mind and getting the focus. But very importantly, in meditation, you must be in a quiet area and a clean area where there's not too much traffic happening. So there shouldn't be too much of uh, movement in that area that, that's happening where you're meditating. Ideally, in nature, it's very, very good. If you can find a park, a lake, or your own garden in your house, outside your house, under a tree, wherever it is, those areas are very, very conducive to meditation. But as I said before, not too much of sound from outside, not too much of traffic uh, where people are walking all the time and just going to disturb you. You want to be in a quiet space. So in your room, ideally, um, 
in your study, wherever there's a quiet space, it's clean and not going to be disturbed, you can practice your meditation there. So when you're practicing your meditation, uh, the Hong Sao technique is one of the best uh, that I found. I also find sound meditation to be very good as well. Uh, you can choose and you can you can select the one that works for you the best, uh, whether it be mindfulness, uh, mantra-based or sound meditation, right? So when you're breathing, with the, how do you practice the Hong Sao technique? It's very, very easy. All you're going to do is, is when you inhale, right? So remember your back, neck and head must be straight to start foot. So your posture must be right. You must close your eyes. You can sit in any comfortable posture. And as you breathe in, you'll say H-O-N-G, Hong, which is a Chinese uh, technique. So Hong. And as you breathe out, you say Sa. So Hong in, Sa out. When you do this technique, you're not going to say anything aloud. It's going to be mental. Right? It's going to say Hong in, mental. And Sa out, mental. Hong in. Sa out. Hong in. Sa out. So, for the first minute, I'm going to say the Hong So with you. So, I'm going to tell you as you breathe in, Hong, and as you breathe out, Sa. We're going to do this one minute. Then, for one minute on your own, you're going to practice this technique, and that will finish our meditation session, right? So, we'll do two minutes of this together. Remember, when you're practicing this technique, you should be doing it for about 10 minutes, right? In a quiet place. Twice a day would be ideal, morning and afternoon uh, would work. But if you're going to do three, that's fine. Um, 10 minutes of, of this should work, uh, but you can go at, at high as 20 minutes. And any time is, 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 is fine. Meditation doesn't have a limit on time. You can do it at any point in time during the day, right? So let's try and do it for one minute together. Let's breathe in. Hong. Sa. Inhale, Hong. Close your eyes. Exhale, Sa. Inhale in Hong. Sa. Inhale Hong. Sa. Inhale Hong. Sa. Inhale Hong. Sa. Hong. Sa. Hong. Sa. Inhale, Hong. Exhale, Sa. Let's do the last one, Hong. Sa. So that simple technique, uh, if you do it for 10 to 15 minutes, you find your mind being a lot more calmer after it. As I said before, the environment is just as important as you practicing the technique. You must practice it correctly, but in the right environment and try and get at least 10 minutes out of the technique. If you can do it for 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening, it's going to be excellent. Um, there's also mindfulness meditation, which is a guided meditation where you become aware of your environment. Um, you can also practice that. I think I'm slightly over time at the moment, so I'm not going to go into a guided meditation with you at the moment because we don't have time for that, but I'm welcome. I think uh, with Rakshika and Mariam, we're welcome to do that at a later point in time uh, with students as well. The other thing that I want to keep you aware of is the sound meditation, and that's uh, Yoga Nidra. If you type in Yoga Nidra on YouTube or sound meditation or NSDR, what does NSDR stand for? Uh, Non-sleep deep rest. So if you actually uh, do NSDR, which is... Very, very, very similar to, to Yoga Nidra, Nidra in the sense that you lie flat on the floor. This is a very, very simple thing to do. It's very, very effective. I want you to try and lie flat on the floor wherever you are, palms facing up. And you can do this whenever you're free. You don't have to do it right now. But palms facing up, lying flat on the floor, close your eyes and put uh, this NSDR music on. Uh, NSDR music on in your room or wherever it is. Uh, or Yoga Nidra music. And listen to that for about 10 minutes. And that will give you the similar effect of meditation as the mantra-based meditation we were talking about just now, and even the mindfulness meditation, which is a, you are normally a guided meditation of your mind, focus, and concentration, right? So I just want to uh, thank everybody, I think, for today. I mean, I've gone slightly over time um, in terms of the session, but obviously, you know, I'm welcome to take um, any questions that people might have uh, on the breathing or the meditation or even the diet or the exercise. Thanks, Mary.
Thank you so much, Prof. Pillay, for that excellent presentation. Um, it was not only informative, but inspiring and motivating as well. In fact, it inspires me to go and add berries to my shopping cart and to start taking my action <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh, what I found particularly uh, uh, beneficial, I think, was the exercises that you shared with us were very practical, they're very doable, they're not time consuming, and they come with mm. immense benefits. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us and your expertise. And okay. yes, we're going to open the session for any questions. Prof is going to have to leave perhaps just before the end of the session because he has another commitment. So if there are any questions for uh, Prof Pillay, you can either go to the chat and uh, type it out or you can uh, go live. You can request us to unmute you, I think. And there's some positive comments coming on the chat as well, Prof. Um, Nampundo sharing, thank you for the breathing exercises. And Imran mm. says he feels calm already. Yeah, so if you want to come to, to Westville for yoga session, please feel free. Uh, the class is free. I got it for students and for staff. So anytime you're welcome. So on a Wednesday, normally I don't know, half past 12. Here's, here's an interesting question, Prof. A student's asking. Yeah, uh, yeah. so, I'm... yeah, Jesus instead of uh, Hang So, uh, Hang So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, even if you, uh, depends, wh whichever faith you're in. If you want to say, inhale G and exhale this, this could also work um, in calming your heart rate down and slowing your breathing down and getting very focused for meditation. Um and even in uh, if you're Islamic, if you're Muslim, Islamic nature, you can also say ah, la, ah, la. So you can actually do that, or you can do G, this. In Chinese, you can do Hong, so. And of course, if you're Hindu, you can do this also uh, Om or, or Brahman. So you can also, depending on what religious faith you are, you can also incorporate that into your meditation technique. Um, this is devoid of, of any religious uh, connotation. You can do it as you please. Some interesting questions on the chat, bro. Okay. Uh, so it's not wise to eat candy while studying. Uh, absolutely not wise to eat candy. Definitely. Uh, as I said, the sugar is going to give you a spike. I would, I would, if you want to go energy, I go for fruit um, as opposed to candy. Uh, fructose does have sugar in it, but it's more. It has higher fiber and a lot of benefits to it, and it's slower releasing. So if you want to, you want an energy boost. My best advice to you is eat a banana or um, eat an orange, uh, as opposed to to going through a candy. Uh, the reason being is that there's still energy in those in those fruits, but there's a lot of antioxidants in them. There's a lot of um, benefits to them overall in terms of in, uh, cell functioning. So I would go with, with fruit rather than candy um, if you wanted those energy levels to come through. Uh, Westford uh, campus, we have the sessions. Uh, normally, we're going to have them now in L1, but we also have them in Comsa Lounge. Um, for mindful meditation, I am I tried it, but I'm, I'm always distracted. It, it can be distracting because it, uh, mindfulness meditation requires you you have some, some focus on the environment, some focus on your physical body, some focus on on sensations. So um, it's likely that your mind can move away from that while you're practicing mindfulness meditation. So that's one of the reasons why some people don't practice mindfulness meditation because it does involve some level of focus and concentration, and um, that's why I say uh, to me the easiest technique is NSDR and Yoga Nidra, where you just have to lie on the flat on the floor in your, in your room, palms facing up, deep, close your eyes, breathe deeply, and listen to the music. And that can give you a very, very uh, calming state uh, of mind for your, for your relaxation or the, the Hong Su technique uh, as a second one. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, Mariam, I think you can put my email address. You can send my email address to all of them um, or um, those who are interested and it, uh, man, you can share the, the yoga information with them. Some people are interested in that. Uh, fruits. What fruits uh, should we take? Um, but, uh, I find that the bananas are quite good in vitamin B. Um, so bananas are definitely, definitely good. Um, but basically, all fruit constitutions are similar. So you're going to get benefits from all the fruits. Um, I found vitamin B to be strong there. 
Um, in terms of focus on your breathing, I think over time, Imran, I think you just gotta take time. It takes time to to develop any skill or ability. So don't get too discouraged that you can't, you know, develop that breathing here. Uh, the yoga sessions on campus normally happen around lunchtime. So it's usually between half past 12 and 1. But I can, I mean, madam, you can organize something for students if you want to come to Howard College or something um, and do something there. I don't mind coming there and having a session with students if they want to uh, have something. Thank you. Uh, something about vegetarian. Madam, do I have time here or do you want me to still... Uh, still can we take one more question and yeah. uh, then close, please? Yeah, okay, so uh, is a pescatarian better than vegetarian for cognitive health? Um, my the, the recent research that I've seen on, on diets show that a, that a vegan diet uh, is superior to a vegetarian diet uh, because dairy does have some inflammation in it um, and the dairy factor does um, actually have a negative impact to some degree um, on brain functioning as well. So the vegan is probably the most cleanest you can get but at the same time, uh, you gotta your basics must be right. Fresh vegetables, fruits, raw. The raw food is is better than processed food. I'll put it that way uh, for brain health. Yeah. Great. And um, thanks so much, Prof. Again, for sharing your expertise with us and for also uh, the invitation to attend the, the yoga sessions. Uh, no problem. Nope. has beautiful gardens um, uh, on the campus. Uh, so if you're ever keen to come down to Peter Marisburg at any point, we can look at hosting one for you on the Marisburg campus. And my colleagues yeah. on the Westville camp, uh, out in the Howard College campus. Yeah, um, maybe do something in the garden sure, there, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure we can organize something on the Howard, Howard College yeah. campus as well. And then yeah. there are some questions in terms of focus, losing focus while studying. Um, and I mm. think our, our other... Um, Speakers will speak to that as well. We'll speak to that. So hopefully yeah. we'll address the questions. Um, okay. So again, on behalf of the uh, students, um, as well as the other panelists, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Take care. Uh, Great. Okay, you, I'm going, going to hand over to our next speaker. So our next couple of speakers have a very uh, short time with you. They've literally got five minutes or so. Um, and they're going to take you through kind of a whistle-stop tour of some very important aspects um, in terms of uh, being calm during exams uh, and exam preparation. Um, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague on the uh, Howard College campus. Um, he comes from the College of Humanities as well, Retabile Olifant. He's a counseling psychologist uh, within the College of Humanities, Student Support Services has been working uh, for at least 10 years um, in the higher education sector. He's quite experienced in individual group therapy um, for various challenges. Um, Retabile, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everyone for coming through. Um, so as Miriam said, I do have about five minutes, so I intend to use it as best as I can. I'm a counseling psychologist, College of Humanities, student support services, and I'm based primarily out of the Howard College campus. What it is that I am going to be speaking about has to do with the idea, the concepts of positive thinking. Now, I have two parts to this that I want to emphasize. Um, the first part has to do with explaining what it is and some of the implications of um, developing a habit and implementing a habit of, pos of positive thinking. And then the other part I feel like is something that can help a person figure out how to do so. Because it can sound like a simple thing, but it's something which is not necessarily easy to do, right? So the first thing that I would like to say about the power or the value of positive thinking is that it can have such a helpful it can, it can be very helpful in terms of shaping what a person expects out of their lives, what a person assumes is possible. And because of that, it can help to increase the likelihood that someone is going to be able to be um, optimistic enough to make the kinds of efforts that are necessary for them to experience the change or the improvement or the outcomes that they want in life. 
And that has to do with a simple idea that a lot of the time when things are not going in a person's favor in life, when things are going wrong, what it is that ends up, what it is that tends to wind up happening with people is that it has an unhealthy impact in terms of how it is that they perceive themselves and how it is that they perceive the world in two ways. The first way is that people tend to struggle with being able to believe that things can be different, that things can change. So when a person finds themselves going through a difficult time, in this case, it might be an upcoming exam. It might be content that you might be struggling with for a particular module. It could be confidence with being able to actually perform well in a test. Um, or at this point, maybe you're supposed to be completing your degree. You might lack the confidence to believe that you would be able to finish in minimum time, whatever it is. Um, when a person is going through a difficult time, one of the first things that can begin to become difficult is that they might find it difficult to believe that their circumstances can change. That's one way. And then another way that um, a person can begin to struggle is that they can find it difficult to believe that things can get better, that things are not only able to change, but that they are capable of changing for the better. And this is important as far as the power of positive thinking, because what positive thinking is about is about developing a habit of being able to understand the truth of the matter. Because in life, more often than not, the fact of the matter is things can change and things can get better. Of course, it is true that some things can stay the same for long periods of time before they change. Of course, it is the case that some things can become worse before they become better. But more often than not, things, circumstances, situations in life are capable of changing and they're capable of changing for the better. And this is important because when a person is able to implement this positive way of thinking, what ends up happening is that their scope of focus, their capacity to be creative in seeking solutions and the confidence that they have in their ability to implement those changes increases rather than decreases. So when a person tends to think in a negative, in a pessimistic, in a cynical way, it makes it harder for them to take the chance of doing things that could help them. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So because they have a difficult time believing that things can change, because they have a difficult time believing that things can become better, they wind up making less effort that is required in order for those outcomes to actually happen. So it winds up reinforcing itself. However, when a person develops the habit of positive thinking, it makes it easier for them to take those chances, to take those risks, to try doing things differently. It doesn't guarantee that things will change. It doesn't guarantee that anything will happen, but it certainly improves the odds, right? And so that's the first thing that is the power of positive thinking. The other part of it, and I'll finish just now, is part of what can help a person be more likely or more willing to think in a positive way is to go about their lives, especially challenges in their lives, to treat them as opportunities to learn things about themselves. I don't know what circumstances that you guys are heading into, into this exam. Maybe you're heading into this exam season with the level of confidence and belief that things are going to be fine. Or maybe you have legitimate reasons to be concerned that things may not work out the way that you want to. What it is that I would want you to have as a way of approaching life is for you to be curious about the fact that um, I have an opportunity to learn something about myself regardless. So that if I'm going to succeed, I want to make sure that I'm succeeding because I gave it my best effort so that I know that I have the ability to do it again later on because I did try my best. I did not get lucky or I can reduce the amount of luck that's required. But if things are not going 
to happen according to plan. If I have to fail, for example, whether that's a test or a season in your life, if I'm going to fail, that I fail honestly. And that means I would have tried my best and things didn't work out for any number of reasons. But that outcome also is a learning opportunity because I know something that's true about myself. It could be the case that my efforts are better served somewhere else. Maybe I don't have as much ability in this area. That means I have the opportunity to try something else. So regardless of what's happening, if you're going to succeed, succeed honestly. Try your best. You're learning about yourself. If you have to fail, fail honestly. Try your best because you still know something about yourself. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard Bile, for your very valuable advice that you've shared. Um, I especially liked the part about stopping the negative, pervasive thinking and developing a habit of realizing that things can change and that things can be better. Um, and treating opportunities as uh, treating challenges opportun as, as opportunities for self-growth. Thank you very much for sharing those words of wisdom with us. Great. Um, we'll take any questions at the end, to be We'll go on to the next panelist, right? Okay. Um, Andile Mkise is our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Andile, for joining us today. Uh, Andile comes from the College of Law and Management. Um, she's a student development officer. Um, she's a registered counseling psychologist and has been part of the university since 2020 in various positions. Uh, Andile, can I hand over to you? Thank Andile, you so much. to us about self -care. Okay. Thanks so much, Miriam. Thank you so much for the introduction. As Miriam has mentioned, my name is Andile. I am the Student Development Officer with the College of Law and Management. And what I'll be talking about today is self-care. So it's finally here. Everybody is stressed. Everybody is tired. But essentially, we can't negate the fact that we must take care of ourselves. So basically, what is self-care? Perhaps each person can just take a moment to reflect and think about it, what it means to them. What self-care means to them? What is taking care of yourself during this exam um, season? So a short definition, a small, simple definition would be that self-care refers to the activities that you, that you do that allow you to take care of your physical and your mental health well-being. So that's a, a, a small, um, simple definition I think that most people can relate to. But why is it so important during this time? The reason why self-care is so important during this time is it because it will help to maintain a positive well-being, as Retabile has mentioned. It helps revitalize and re-energize your brain to support you achieve some of the goals that you have set for yourself. And then it also helps prevent exhaustion and the potential for any mental health difficulties thereafter. So kind of like a battery, you know, we need to treat ourselves almost like a battery. And if we allow our battery to deplete completely, then we're not going to be able to study or write at our optimum level. Whereas if we keep the battery topped up by engaging in self-care, it allows us more energy and more resilience in approaching our academic demands right now. So if we're not able to do that, so if there's a lack of self-care that reduces the ability for us to be attentive and present. And when I talk about being attentive, we're not able to, when we're sitting at the table or when we're listening to the lectures or when, or when we're sitting within our study groups to be able to be attentive to what the content is being shared at that time and then being present. So what happens if we're not going to be engaging in, in, in a lot of self-care, we end up being stressed out. And when we're stressed out, we get worrisome in the sense that we eventually start thinking ahead. We start thinking about the future, almost like in a panic mode. What's going to happen if, what's going to happen if, you know, we start asking ourselves questions in a pessimistic manner. And then also 
Um, we might think about the past, you know, what happened previously, what happened last semester, and we dwell on our failures and our misachievements. So that's when we don't engage in self-care um, enough. But with that being said, what are the signs that we can look out for that indicate that we're not engaging enough in self-care? And maybe we need to prioritize it a bit more. So these are the things that you need to look out almost to reflect on yourself, what's going on in your own world. Are you unable to concentrate? Are you sitting at the table wanting to study, but your mind is racing? Or you almost go in a state of a trance, you know, that you're not completely there. That's your brain telling you that you're overwhelmed. You need a break. You need to take a breather and, you know, engage in a bit of self-care. You're irritable with others. You haven't taken a nap. You haven't slept in a while. Um, so you're irritable low motivation, a lack of interest in doing any type of studying, your increased, um, your anxiety has increased, you have low moods and you're finding it difficult to sleep. And then also your appetite, you know, you've lost your appetite or you have an increased appetite. Those are just some of the signs that you need to watch out for and um, evaluate where you are in terms of yourself your self-care. And then some of the physical symptoms that you might experience is fatigue. Your body is responding. It's telling you that, you know what, I need a break. Um, and so also you might experience a few headaches or migraines, weight loss or weight gain, loss of hair. Those are the type of physical symptoms that you need to look out for that are indicating to you that um, you need to engage in a bit more of self-care. So once you've evaluated all those things, what can I do to look after myself? What can I do to self-care? There are such simple things that um, are at your reach that you can do. And firstly, the first speaker has already elaborated this um, lengthy, that you need to consume healthy food and drinks during your exam. You know, it's a common habit that we have when we stressed that we reach out for sugary or caffeinated food, but unfortunately it only exacerbates the stress. And these things will only give you energy for a short moment of time. And then thereafter, it fades out, which can also lead in you feeling very anxious um, and also very exhausted. So try to balance out um, your food intake, what you are having during this time. I know that most students will engage in um, consuming Bioplast, Monster, these different um, supplements, but you need to be able to find a balance between the two, or even as like the first speaker had mentioned, substitute with more healthier foods, such as your starch and your vegetables and your, and, and, um, your, your, your fruits. Those are the type of things that will assist you a lot in terms of um, getting your energy levels up most of the time throughout this session. And then secondly, I cannot stress this enough. We need to create a healthy sleeping pattern. Having a good night's sleep during the exam is so crucial for several reasons, and it directly impacts our cognitive and our physical functioning. And so some of the reasons why getting an adequate sleep is important during exams is for your cognitive performance. Sleep is essential for cognitive performance, such as your memory, your attention, and um, your problem solving. So getting a good rest will assist you very much. Concentration and focus, um, sleep will help with that. A lack of sleep can lead to a reduced concentration of focus, and you may find it difficult to stay awake and attentive during the exam which can lead to a lot of careless mistakes and which will lower your performance ultimately. And then um, another reason why sleep is important is information retention. Sleep is essential for the consolidation of new information and memory. When you study and then you sleep, your brain um, gets strengthened and allows it to consolidate all the information that you've learned, making it easier for you to recall everything during the exams. And then lastly, it's so important that you speak to someone. As the student support services, we are there for you guys. We're available at all times when you feel as though that you're overwhelmed, your stress management, your time management, you're struggling with those aspects. Come through to see the student counselors. They are there to assist you with such difficulties. But other than that, breathe, guys. Everything will be okay. Thank you so much, Miriam. Lovely. Thank you so much, Angelia, for that valuable uh, information advice that you've shared with students. Um, 
especially for me, about paying attention to signs of when we're not taking care of ourselves um, and then the steps that we could try uh, in terms of self-care. Thank you so much, Indine. Um, to our participants, we are very well aware that it's now two o'clock. Um, please, can you give us a few minutes? We've got two more speakers who are going to share some information in terms of active learning and in terms of time management, which um, are going to be very, uh, you know, uh, beneficial in terms of your uh, the actual exam taking. Um, I'm just checking with uh, our PR guys. Is it okay if we give our last two speakers, please, the time? Um, I'll, I'm just going to wait until. Hi, the time. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. The session is open. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Rakshita. I'm now going to hand over to Sanele Zuma. Uh, Sanele, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, Sanele comes from the College of uh, Agriculture, Engineering and Science. Uh, he's a student development officer at Student Support Services, also from the Peter Marinsburg campus, just like I am. Uh, Sanele has in uh, extensive experience in the development and facilitation of student development programs in and outside of the university. Um, in fact, I think when there's any activities, uh, life skills training um, happening at the residences, for example, uh, we always know Samele is you know, somebody we can turn to and Samele is somebody who's going to be there. Um, Samele's core mandate has been to ensure that students are equipped with essential academic career and psychosocial skills to aid their success at university and importantly beyond. Sanel is going to be talking to us about a very important aspect in terms of exam management prep, and that's time management. Sanel, um, handing over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, my stopwatch is on. I'll stick to five minutes. Well, time management. Um, in my many years of being here at the university, I think I started in 2010 as an intern. I can tell you that there is no bigger threat to a student's academic success as poor time management. Um, we often fail assessments that were easy to pass. Sometimes we get average marks on assessments that we could have aced. Quite often, um, our results are uh, a reflection of our time and not a reflection of our potential. So you, you don't get to university by chance. You have what it takes. There are so many students who get excluded for you to make the space. Uh, so there is a lot of potential. And a lot of students actually end up leaving, not because it was too hard, simply because uh, they didn't put enough time. So that's why when we talk time management, I tend to focus more on self-management um, because it goes together, uh, self and time management. It's easy for most of us to do timetables, plan, but to put that plan into action is something that calls for a, a change in attitude. You know, it, it speaks more to self-management. And um, it's, it speaks to, to your attitude, basically. Uh, it speaks to the oomph. In this is what say to Gozo, I mean, uh, you, you, you need to find it. Uh, that's why it's important for you guys to take your career interest seriously. Some of you are just not putting in effort simply because you are in programs that you are not passionate about. And it becomes very difficult for you to be as disciplined and committed. And you come across as a person who's lazy, yet it's because you are just doing something that you have zero interest in. So uh, do consult when you have those kind of problems. So what could help this attitude shift probably uh, in the three minutes I have? One, you are a student, and whatever that defines you the most in life should be dominating your 24 hours. If we come across somebody and they introduce themselves as a preacher or a pastor, 
we can already predict without even seeing them that they pray a lot, they read the Bible, they go to church because they are a, a pastor. You are a student. Yes, a student who happens to have a partner, a student who happens to have friends, um, a family, who happens to play sport, but you are a student. So your priorities need to go with your main identity. Once your 24 hours is not dominated by what defines you, then that's where trouble starts. Two, uh, school is not nice, let's be honest. Um, uh, I, I doubt that as we are drawing close to the end of the semester, people will be at home uh, missing school. So who are miss waking up and being in class at 7.45, who are miss just starting uh, having those sleepless nights, who I miss going through so many chapters on a day. It's not pleasant for somebody who's at your age. There are many other things that you find exciting, but it remains very critical. And what happens is this. If you go for instant gratification, you choose to entertain that which excites you, whether I'm watching Netflix, whether I'm going out with friends or visiting a partner, whatever the case is, or having a beer or two. If you always go with those things that interest you, um, you run the risk of compromising uh, bigger things. So basically, if you are here for three years, because your trigger is three years or it's four years, but it's so hard for you to be disciplined in three years, you end up compromising the next 30, 40 years. Because once you are excluded here, the quality of life changes quite significantly. And as a very old person, I can tell you that one of those things that are very difficult to live with is regret. You don't want to reach a point where you feel it wasn't hard. I just didn't do it because that uh, is a lot to deal with. That's 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 number two. And, and then manipulate your environment. Um, if you don't do that, you end up failing with very good reasons. You know, when you're driving and you're at the robot and you come across somebody who's on the street and they tell you a story, more times than not, you'll understand why they got there. Okay, they have a very credible story, but it doesn't change the fact that they are on the street. Some of us are faced with quite a lot of challenges. Maybe you are off campus, maybe you're staying at home, maybe funds are an issue, this, this, and that. It will affect you. But the question is, how do I still maneuver and how do I still protect my studies in the midst of all that is happening? You know, so some of us may need to come sacrifice our weekends because we don't get enough time during the week to push for work. You know, those kind of things. We need to, 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 to be in that position. Basically, as I close, um, yes, we need to have routines. Uh, we need to have study plans, but most of all, we just need to have a change in attitude. Thank you, Maram. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sunele, for your very informative and beneficial presentation. I'm very impressed at how you role modeled good time management. Thank you so much. Um, your advice in terms of self slash time management now and using your time wisely now um, compromises or determines your next 20, 30 years. I found that incredibly powerful. Thank you so much for sharing your advice with our students, Vanelli, um, and for being very patient with us as we, uh, are, as we are getting through the program. Last, though not least, um, is our panelist, from the College of Health Sciences, uh, Suzanne Stokes. Uh, welcome, uh, Suzanne, and thank you for so patiently waiting for your time. Suzanne is an educational psychologist who offers counseling and psychoeducation to students in the College of Health, Health Sciences. Interestingly, she uses technology in her individual therapy, in her webinars, and advocates for better self-care in a digital life. She helps students cope with various challenges and offers creative and innovative therapies to address them. A 
um, linked to our presentation today. Suzanne believes that self-compassion and meditation techniques are essential for managing stress and anxiety. And um, uh, Suzanne's going to be talking to us about active learning and test-taking strategies as her PowerPoint on screen is reflecting. Suzanne, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariam, and good afternoon, everybody. Sal Borna, thank you for having me. So let's get ourselves ready. Let's start with those basics. So what does it mean to study? What does studying look like for you? And we know that to study or study being a verb, it requires an action. So studying is what you make it out to be. Is studying fun and exciting? Or is it boring and exhausting? You owe it to yourself to have a good idea of what it means for you. Have that vision of what um, you would like it to be. And I think that I'm definitely going to be spending a lot of time unpacking that in my five minutes. So studying requires a lot from you. And if you have all these aspects that we speak of today scheduled daily, the art of studying becomes easier. So let's do it differently. Studying should be fun and exciting and even enjoyable. When last did you enjoy studying? What made it enjoyable in the past? Go on that journey of self-reflection. And if you, can, if you can see yourself engaging well again during a study session, you are slightly more motivated to try some more and have fun at the same time. So let's reset today and set your new study strategy and possibly it might be even something you've done before. There may be many challenges just as Sanele had unpacked and as well as the other speakers that will impact your ability to study. Uh, so let's focus on how to do it well. Your active learning strategy will also um, prevent that procrastination from setting in when we feel overwhelmed um, and when we're feeling unable to continue. So first things first, let's set the stage. Set up a specific study area and be creative with the available space that you have and test those different areas and make sure that there is always good light as well as internet connection. Set up a routine that is free from disruptions, wake up early, take a bath, it helps set up your station, come prepared to each study session, sit with a peer who will encourage you, make those mini notes of things you need to go back to, and make sure you have a study, a good study space with good lighting, make sure you have your study supplies, attend study sessions to study those that study content and talk to students who are doing the same course as you. And most importantly, know when the exam is, what to study and as well as what to study. So let, that's just really setting that stage. So let's go into a little more depth as to the different activities and actions you would get involved in while studying. So reflect on your definition of what studying is, and it should involve and include that busyness of engaging, writing, talking, drawing, doing, and having fun and testing yourself. That's what active learning is all about. It is a skill that requires practice. And so use a strategy that will help you to identify and construct meaning when reading information. And we utilize some self-regulation skills that will help us to use the, our time effectively to refocus our attention and maintain our concentration over time. So it adds to, to all of that. Check regularly to see if you have met your learning objectives for your studying session. So what does this active learning look like? So it may be as simple as what you just see on the screen. Summarize. Summarize the main points of a lecture or reading assignment in your own words. And this can help you to better understand what is most important. And it helps you to automatically start retaining the information better. While you're taking notes, read it out loud. Don't just rewrite the textbook. By reading out loud and taking these notes, it will help you to stay engaged and again, help you to retain information better. Test yourself on the material that you've been studying. This will help you to identify what, what um, aspects you need more practice on, and it will definitely, with more exposure, improve your performance on your exam. So make a note of what you don't know and spend time on work in that. You will notice that your confidence levels will improve because you're starting to fill up your gaps in knowledge. Be encouraged to, stay, to study with someone. 
It may not be easy to ask someone, but it has many benefits. Work in pairs or some small groups uh, to discuss and explain some course material to each other. So use that existing study support strategies or structures such as mentors, um, use those lecture recordings, those revision recordings or online MOOCs and quizzes. This will also help you to unpack and solve real world problems by having those conversations uh, and, and being able to relate that to that course material. And the final last active um, learning strategy is active reading. So actively engage with the text by asking questions, make connections, summarizing those key points. And this will again help you to retain information better and improve your understanding uh, as well as your critical thinking skills. It's as easy as applying the SQ3R reading strategy um, to, you know, that, that we've been taught while we were at school. Reading techniques will help improve concentration and your me memory recall. So I hope those active learning strategies are helpful. Let's jump straight into exam test taking strategies, and these will help you to perform better um, exams. Read the instructions carefully. So before starting in your exam, this will help you to understand what is expected of you and will avoid you avoid um, making those those careless mistakes answer easy questions first and then move on to the more difficult ones and this will help you to build your confidence and avoid getting stuck on those difficult questions manage your time effectively during an exam allocate more time to those difficult questions and leave enough time at the end to go back and review your answers and make sure that you actually you know complete all the questions Eliminate wrong answers before making any type of guess. This will increase your chances of really, um, you know, improving your overall score. Stay calm and focus. You could implement some of the meditation techniques or um, just some clearing of the mind techniques by taking some deep breaths, stretching, closing your eyes for a few seconds, especially when you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed. And avoid distractions especially before an exam, uh, avoid using your cell phone, music, or any electronic devices prior, just kind of recenter yourself, clear your mind, and ground yourself. These dis distractions can definitely increase anxiety and can impact your ability to perform in an exam. And finally, review your answers at the end of exam. Check for simple things like spelling mistakes, incomplete answers, or any other mistakes that you have made. So in that quick five minute nutshell share, I do hope that these strategies are helpful and I just want to appreciate you all for listening in and for staying behind. Have a wonderful afternoon and, and good luck with your exams. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And uh, I think we want to appreciate you for the time that you've taken to put together a very um, engaging presentation and sharing some very, very valuable insights. And I think for me, the one that kind of stuck is uh, the one that you started with, where you spoke about the mindset uh, in terms of learning to enjoy uh, enjoy studying. Um, and I think that definitely paves the way, um, you know, it makes it a much more pleasant journey the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Um, to the panelists, to, um, to my uh, peers, uh, a sincere, sincere thanks to you for the sea of wisdom and knowledge that you showered us today during your presentations. To our participants, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for giving us the um, extra time um, that we've taken from you. We do hope that you found today's sessions beneficial. Um, as a reminder, the yoga sessions happen on the Westville campus. Um, I think our uh, PR rep has shared Prapali's email address. Uh, Rakshika, if you haven't, please uh, share it. Uh, so any questions with regards to the yoga lessons, uh, you can contact Prop himself. And then all of the other panelists, as a reminder, do come from Student Support Services. Uh, on the different campuses. Our offices are here. You're very welcome to uh, set up an appointment and come in and chat to us. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. There was a question with regards to um, 
And Dile wants to know where and how can you uh, access past exam papers. Uh, past exam papers are available online. So if you go to your student portal, you will find that there is um, a forum where a student can access past exam papers. You can also go to your library and um, check with your librarians as well. Uh, thanks so much, Rakshika, for sharing Prof Pillay's uh, email address. Uh, it's pillays18 at ukzn.ac.za. Prof had to leave us um, because he does have a prior engagement as well as Ritabile. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, in extension, I'd like to thank both of them for, um, for being present and sharing uh, their knowledge with us today. Yes, every campus does have a student support services. Edgewood Campus, we've got two counseling space there. Uh, Lindy, Lindy Ngubane and um, there's a new lady that's joined her. Uh, they used to be based next to the clinic. Uh, I'm not too sure if they, because of the um, refurbishment that's happening on the West, the Westville campus, I think they based in a temp place. But if you go and check with the clinic, they'll direct you to them. Thank you for that. That's an important question. Okay, so I'm just going to give you guys a few minutes to please um, um, bring up any questions that you do have and definitely echo what uh, Rakshika has said on the chat. We wish you the best of luck with the exam. Um, and the fact that you've taken time out to come and attend the presentation to get it today uh, you know, speaks uh, well uh, for you. Okay, this is the last stretch. You've got to this point. It's about just having the uh, positive mindset of using the simple yet very powerful and effective breathing techniques, paying attention to self-care in terms of um, um, time management, self-management, uh, and active learning strategies. So thank you very much, guys. Rakshika, thank you very much for initiating this session. And again, a big thank you to all my panelists for joining. Okay, I think if there are no other questions, we can um, end the session. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon.